Good evening, everybody, and welcome to webinar 39. Um, today, we are talking to Ben Ashcroft and myself and Dave are going to have a little chat with you just before we start. So um, we're on webinar 39. There are 86 people here tonight. And what we're going to talk about is I want you to tell me the usual where you are in the world. Are you a social worker? Are you a student, practice educator? Are you in a related field? Um, tell us what kind of job you do, where you are in the world. And specifically, when you were a child, what was your favourite toy? So um, 243 people and we're at five past. Um, I'm going to hand over to Siobhan and I'm going to jump into the chat and read back all of your comments. because I've just spotted etch a sketch. Yeah. So um, I'm going to switch myself on mute now. Enjoy yourselves, guys. So um, if you have been to our sessions before, you will know this is one of our regular Wednesday night sessions. It's actually number 39. We are delighted to be joined tonight, um, as Kelly said, by Ben Ashcroft. You'll have seen um, Ben's bio a little bit on our social media and on the posters. But maybe you've come tonight not because it's a regular Wednesday night webinar that we do, but maybe you've come tonight just because um, you wanted to hear from Ben and you know lots more about Ben. But we are absolutely delighted. Many of us in the team are huge fans of Ben's work and have read the book. And uh, in fact, Kultuma took this photograph today so we could put a bit of a slide together. I thought it was very artistically put together by Kultuma at lunchtime today. She sent me over this, slide, this uh, picture so we could pop it on a slide. Um, because tonight we're not gonna have any slides. Tonight it's going to be a very intimate night with Ben. So I'm gonna stop the screen sharing now. And Chris is going to spotlight Ben and uh, we're all just going to be able to watch and listen to Ben. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Ben. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're all really looking forward to learning from you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Right, so for people that don't know me, I'm gonna start at the beginning of my journey and the after care and before care, so I'll just start. So I was born in 1983 in Halifax, in West Yorkshire, in the UK. Um, and I lived in a place called Mixingdon, and Mixingdon is quite a rough area with a lot of groups of young people and quite a lot of antisocial behavior and quite a, it was kind of an overflow from different areas to Mixingdon originally. And within that, my dad moved here um, with his family from Liverpool um, and then my mum lived in Ilkley but my mum were in care um, so she ended up living in Mixingdon as well um, so they got together in the early 80s um, so I was born in 1983 and I lived with my mum my dad and my sister and my brother my sister being 14 months older and my brother three and a bit years older so I lived in Mixingdon until I was about two. And then at two years old, my dad beat my mum up quite badly and he got arrested and he got sent to prison. So that was kind of the first move. I was two and we moved to a women's refuge in Halifax. And we lived there for about a year. Um, and I still remember it quite vividly. I remember the layout of it, even though I were only nearly like three years old. Um, and then from there, we moved to a place called Sorby Bridge, which is also near Halifax in West Yorkshire. And my mum was quite dysfunctional and she drunk quite a bit. Um, and quite quickly, she got with another, another guy and got married quite quickly to him. Um, but this guy was a DJ in the local area, so we were out and drinking most weekends and my mum drunk quite a bit as well. But this guy was quite violent towards my mum, so we witnessed quite a lot of domestic violence um, from very early on, from my dad to now this second husband of my mum. And on occasions, like one occasion, he put water in all the electrics and tried to kind of blow the house up with us all in it. And then on another occasion, he put us all in the back of his car and my mum in front and drove at high speed towards a wall and at the other side of this wall were about 150 meter drop um, but it broke at the last minute um, so which were quite terrifying as kind of a four five year old kid um, and we were obviously screaming and frightened in back of that because they were arguing at the same time as him driving really fast towards this sort of cliff edge but there were kind of a big brick wall in front of it before you went over but luckily you stopped 
And my mum still didn't leave him at this point either. Um, and quite quickly after that, again, we were in his home and he beat my mum up and she rung police and the police came. And he resisted arrest badly and we had an old wicker kind of sofa thing with cushions on and he wouldn't let go of it. So the police were hitting him with buttons and handcuffing him and, and he, and he just kind of kicked off quite badly. And it took him quite a while and quite a few police officers to restrain him and carry him out of the house. Um, so that was the last time we seen him. So from there, we moved again to another place in Sorby Bridge, uh, which were a nicer part of Sorby Bridge. And quite close to his house, we had woods. And then there were a fishing dam about 80 metres away from his house. And then the canal and river were about 200 metres away and fields and football pitches and rugby pitches. So it were a much nicer area. So there, I started going fishing in the morning before school, after school, and any chance I got, really. But as had happened previously, my mum got with someone else quite quickly and married him as well. Um, but this guy was very different. He, he wasn't violent towards my mum, or certainly not in front of us. Um, and this guy played football on a Saturday and rugby on a Sunday. Um, and he also got me into a rugby team outside of school, and I was the captain of my junior school football team inside school. Um, but I used to like it because it, it kind of invested a lot of time in us and I quite quickly built a relationship with him and I, and I liked him and he'd take us to football on a Saturday and rugby on a su Sunday but within that kind of environment of football and rugby on a weekend would be around pubs because after the games we'd it'd be back to a pub so again we'd be around alcohol and, and kind of all that kind of behaviour and a lot of drinking and obviously football teams and rugby teams full of men drinking and stuff and and my mum would argue as well with him and but they generally didn't do it in front of us which obviously I'm quite happy about and stuff but they would argue and stuff and my mum jumped quite heavily so but after a while of being with him and we were quite settled and enjoying kind of life I suppose because we we weren't seeing the domestic violence and the and the kind of abuse that I'd put my mum in and beating her up and that kind of stuff and seeing her with black eyes and marks and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he were very different, so we did like him. Um, but what we didn't know is by the time we'd kind of got on a little bit after she'd married him, she, she, my mum found out that he'd cheated on her with one of the neighbours. So at that point, my mum left him and then told us we're moving now back to Mixingdon, where I was born. Um, but when we moved back to Mixingdon, I didn't know anyone in that area. I didn't have any kind of relationships with anyone at all. And my brother had gone to live back with my dad at this point as well. So Mixingdon were quite rough and there's a top end, a middle end and a bottom end, um, which were kind of a lot of groups of young people and a lot of antisocial behaviour and stuff. So for me, when I first moved back there, it kind of I was isolated in the house and the garden. So I wouldn't kind of go out because in fear of being kind of beaten up or taxed, as they used to say back then, um, and that kind of stuff. So I was very isolated and stayed kind of in the garden and house. But my mum would keep going out drinking and sometimes she won't come back for a night. Um, and that kind of continued for the early part of moving there. But after a short while, my brother turned up with two bin liners. Um, and loads of bruises and marks on him. And my dad, who had got with another lady who's got three of her own kids, she'd beaten my brother up with a belt and physically beaten him up and with a buckle and a belt. And he had bruises and marks everywhere and that kind of stuff. And But for me, I was happy that he moved back in with us because I got to share a bedroom with him. And with him being three years older than me, I kind of enjoyed his music and that kind of stuff. Whereas obviously he were a teenager at this point. So... For him, it was probably very different. I was probably his annoying little brother, um, whereas I enjoyed having him. And not only that, he knew people in that area. So that gave me the freedom and access to go outside of the garden and the house and stuff. Um, and quite quickly, I got involved with the antisocial behaviour and a lot of the young people and kind of the kind of causing a bit of chaos, but kind of sort of staying in the middle end because we lived in the middle end and like I said, the top end were kind of the roughest part and then the middle end were kind of the probably the the nicest part and the bottom end were quite rough as well. And there were quite a lot of addiction in that area and poverty and austerity and stuff like that. Um, so kind of 
with my brother moving back, it led me to go outside and get involved with these other young people and stuff. And and my behaviour was deteriorating and my mum didn't really have the skills to cope with us, I suppose, because me and my brother started arguing, me and my sister were arguing, and then sometimes we'd all be arguing and, and she didn't really have the skills to cope with us. Um, so she'd kind of drink more, stay out longer and that kind of stuff. And then kind of a, in the summer in Mixingdon, there's a reservoir and the police run a splash scheme um, where they try to kind of steer young people away from the kind of antisocial behaviour and criminal behaviour. But the group I were with weren't involved in that. Um, so on this occasion, we went to this reservoir and the police were doing canoeing with the young people in that area or the ones that were involved in it. Um, but one of the other young people that were with us, he had a, um, a pellet gun, a repeater pellet gun and kind of passed it me and said, oh, why don't you shoot this pellet gun? So I did and I shot at this canoe a couple of times and it bounced off it. And then we all run off quite quickly. Um, but the next day, we there were a knock at the back door and there were quite a big chap stood there, a police officer. Mm -hmm. And at the time, yeah, he were a professional rugby player for Bradford Bulls. Um, so he was quite a big, intimidating kind of guy. Uh, but I never got in trouble with him. He kind of spoke to my mum and that kind of stuff. And I never got in trouble. So I kind of didn't learn anything from what I'd done um, and almost, almost thought, well, I can do what I want type thing. Um, and my behaviour continued to get worse and worse. And my mum was staying out longer and longer, drinking more and more. And then she ended up getting with another guy and they'd go out drinking. And again, there'd be a lot of domestic violence between them as well. Um, and then she'd stay at his house sometimes for a night or two nights and not come back and that kind of stuff. But we got near Christmas one year and she didn't come back for the first night, second night, and then third night. And then kind of on third day, I rung the police um, and then the police turned up within about 20 minutes, half an hour. And then the emergency duty team social worker turned up. Um, and then we kind of disclosed to them, we'd not seen my mum, we didn't know if she were dead or alive. And we'd been eating kind of jam sandwiches and custard creams and just a basic stuff because we didn't know how to cook really. Um, so at this point, the uh, emergency duty team social worker said that my sister's going to go to a friend's and me and my brother are going to go to a local children's home um, which is what happened so at this point I were obviously quite upset leaving my sister and leaving my own bedroom and not knowing where my mom was and if she were alive or if she were dead or whatever um, kind of didn't know and then moved to this children's home and the children's home where we moved to was close to where my dad lived with my brother. So my brother, again, in that area, which were quite a rough area, knew people in that area. So it kind of gave me freedom there to kind of go out. But I didn't really go out because my brother at that point didn't really want to hang around with me. He kind of had his own friends in that area. So I kind of made friends with the young people in the home that I were in. Um, so... After a few days of being there, some of the young people kind of refused to go to bed. And in this children's home, it had steps on either stairs on either side of the home. So you could kind of do a 360 around the stairs and go in one bedroom and out of another and basically run staff ragged and let them chase us around for an hour. And then after an hour, the staff said, if you don't go to bed, you're going to get locked up. So I went to bed that first first time. Um, but a couple of days after that, they said, um, well, they called us into office. So we went into office and they says, your mom's been found in Blackpool. She's drunk and that kind of stuff and having a good time. Um, but she don't want you and your brother back, but your sister's going home. Um, so at that point, kind of almost instantly felt angry and upset and kind of abandoned and unloved and unwanted. And kind of right there were kind of a start changing my behavior. Um, so the kind of a day after that, I'd gone out and stuff and I came back to the home on the evening. So I'll read a quick chapter out of my book. So some people probably recognise this. I get back to Cousin Lane and go to my room. One of the other young people is kicking off. He is shouting, swearing and breaking things. I go out of my room and see what's happening. And now there are two residents kicking off. So I think, fuck it and join in as well. So now there are three of us doing the same thing. As any kid who's grown up in care will know, kicking off is an all-encompassing and somewhat melodramatic term used by adults who are paid to care, describing any disruptive behaviour by a child or young person. 
the chances are by kicking off, they are actually simply trying to tell you something. Often this behaviour will include shouting, swearing, throwing stuff and basically any behaviour which a young person uses to hide their fears and feelings. It can be feared by adults, provoked by adults and definitely avoided by adults if they are willing to explore why the young person is demonstrating this behaviour through talking to them and listening to what they have to say. So at this point, I joined in with these young people and running around the house and kind of refusing to go to bed. Um, and then about again, after an hour, the staff said, if you don't go to bed, you're going to get locked up. So at this point, I just said, go for it. I kind of didn't care because I wasn't going home. The other young people were kind of behaving how they was. So I joined in and kind of didn't really care, I suppose, but also didn't understand the consequences of the behavior I were doing so the police were called and within about 10 minutes the police turned up and myself and the two other young people there got put in separate police cars and handcuffed um, so at this point the police officer who had arrested me hit me a couple of times and told me it's yes sir no sir you little bastard when you get to custody so at this point I'm frightened and scared and obviously crying and not knowing what's going to happen and kind of the same happened when I got to the Bridewell at Halifax. So it's, it repeated, same again, when you go in there, it's yes sir, no sir, you little bastard when you speak to the sergeant, which I didn't even really know what sergeant was and I didn't know what we were going to be on the other side of this door, so it was quite a frightening experience. Um, but we went through and then quite quickly got put into a cell. And then when I got put in a cell, there were no light on, there were no mattress, no cover, and doors shut. So I was sat there pretty much in pitch black, um, crying and obviously scared of being in that environment because I'd not been in that environment before and didn't know really what were to come. And I was left there for about four hours. And then I came out because the emergency duty team had come and my rights were read um, with the sergeant at desk. And then I was put back in a cell for a couple more hours. And then brought back out again and the emergency duty team social worker told me at this point I'm moving now to foster parents 11 miles away. Um, so now within the first or just week of being split up from my own house and my own covers and my own bed and my sister and my mum, now I've been split up from my brother as well as having my first charge of a section five public order offence for refusing to go to bed which is quite shocking really and also moved so now I'm on my own 11 miles away from where where I've been staying in this children's home plus being split up from everything I knew and everyone I knew um, and quite quickly I got in, into the running off stuff and jumping on trains back to Halifax from Todmorden and meeting up with my brother and other young people in that area and quite quickly, I was getting moved because I wasn't staying in placements. I'd get moved and then get moved to another children's home. And quite quickly, I'd be moved quite a lot of times. And sort of by 12 and 13, I was sleeping in waste paper skips, um, in bus station toilets on my own and stuff, because I didn't want to go back to wherever I were, whichever placement I were at at that point. But also within that, I'd meet up with other young people that were in children's homes and I'd sneak into their home and hide under the bed and sleep there. Um, so I was running away from one placement and then sleeping in another placement under someone's bed, hiding from the staff there or the foster care or whoever it was that were placed. Um, and I started drinking at this point as well and taking drugs and committing offences, more kind of criminal damage sort of stuff, like I'd been back to my mum's and she wouldn't let me in so I put a brick through a front room window and then sort of in a children's home I threw the TV out a front room window and then a TV out of my bedroom window, so we were mounting um, offences up quite quickly and I got put on a curfew of 7-7, seven, seven. Um, so I wasn't allowed out after 7 o'clock in an evening and not allowed out before 7 o'clock in the morning um, so at this point, I was breaching my curfew pretty much every night. And I think out of about two months at one point, I spent about 40 nights in police custody. Um, and 
get, kept getting took to court in the morning. Uh, group four would pick us up from police station and then took to court and then kind of be out for half 11, 12 o'clock every day. And then just meet back up or I'd get taken back to my placement by youth bending team or emergency social worker or my own social worker. And then I'd just leave the placement. I'd go in, sometimes go in through front door and straight out the back door and then meet back up with people and continue this. And I kind of learned quite quickly that I didn't want to get caught in an evening because what we'd do is we'd go into kind of Halifax town centre and cause chaos and drinking. And I'd get arrested sometimes at 10, 11 o'clock on, on an evening and then have to sustain the police station all night till morning and then out of court in morning. So I learned quite quickly if I am myself in at half seven, eight o'clock every morning at police station, then I'd be in court um, by sort of 10, half 10 and let out sort of between 11, half 11. So I just did that. So I only had to spend a few hours in police custody in the morning and then I'd get out. And because they kind of didn't have anywhere to send me, I'd kind of just get remanded back to the care of the local authority. Um, but after like so this period of two months where I'd done it about 40 times out of about 60 days. The magistrate who um, kept seeing me on a regular basis said that I needed to be moved out of authority or put somewhere. So at this point I got moved into um, Jewsbury to a structured unit at that point. Um, so that were kind of, it were locked so you couldn't kind of go out but you got to go out for activities on an evening so I'd go to Bradford Ice Skating Room so when we got there, I kind of just run off from there and, and I'd walk all the way back to Halifax. And sometimes it'd take me all night until the next day because I didn't know where I was and didn't know where I was going. And, and like I say, it could literally take all night till the next day to get back to where I knew in Halifax. Um, but the structured unit were kind of for 15 year olds onwards, um, but I were only kind of 13. So we're always with older people. Um, and again, after there, came back out, got put back in a children's home in Halifax in Skirkot Lodge. And again, I was continuing the drinking and taking drugs and committing offences um, and then getting moved back some of the times back to the same placements and stuff. Uh, but again, they kind of, because I was breaching my curfew so often, the magistrate said again, he needs moving out of authority, um, which is what happened. I got moved to Derbyshire to a, a place near Matlock and it was kind of an activity centre with three young people. So every day you'd kind of do rock climbing, up sailing, canoeing and that kind of stuff, um, which I enjoyed, but it were only a sort of a short placement um, because I heard quite frequently, well, this is costing £6,000 a week. So you can only stay for 28 days and then he needs moving on. Um, and that's kind of what happened. I got moved then to a foster placement in Bolton. Um, so when I got there, my introduction to the foster person was go make me and your social worker a drink. Um, at that point, I didn't even know how to make drinks and stuff. And I knew instantly that that were going to be an awful placement and it did turn out to be that. Um, because every day, because I went in education and I was sharing a room with another boy from Liverpool um, and in bunk beds in that room, We'd get kicked out at half eight, nine o'clock in the morning and told not to come back till sort of four or four of an evening because we want an education. So quite quickly, we got involved with other young people on that estate and kind of just being antisocial and basically passing time because we weren't allowed in, in the house during the day. Um, and quite quickly, the foster man there, he had a metal bar on his um, key ring, what you use to kill fish. Um, but he'd hit us both on the head with it, so we'd have quite a few lumps on his head, quite regular, um, what he'd do to us. And because I were from Yorkshire and the other boy were from Liverpool, they'd kind of call us names and that kind of stuff. And, and it was a pretty horrible place, to be honest. And on one occasion, me and the boy from Liverpool run off to Liverpool for a couple of days and we got split up. So I handed myself into police and um, taken back to the placement in Bolton. Um, but the the, abuse, the physical abuse and mental abuse and emotional abuse continued generally by the foster man, like I said, hit us on the head with this little metal bar you kill fish with. Um, so again, I didn't stay there for very long. Kind of, again, left there and then went to Bolton train station mm -hmm. and hid in the toilets back to Halifax on trains. Um, and when I got back to Halifax, I kind of 
I was kind of a little bit traumatized, I'd say. Um, and it was quite a horrible place to be at. And I didn't want to go back there. So in my head, I had a choice. I got some paracetamols and a drink. And I thought, well, it's either do that or get sent back to placement. So I kind of took all these paracetamols at time thinking I'll take them and then that'll be it. Um, but obviously that's, that's not how it works. Um, but I was so naive and didn't kind of understand what, what you kind of did to do that, not knowing it would be kind of a long, painful process, which I didn't know. Um, so I were admitted to a children's hospital for a few days. And then after that, um, I got picked up by police officers and taken to a place called the Elland. And then I got um, video recorded and disclosed what had been happening at this placement. And kind of, I didn't want to go back there and, it was just an horrible place and luckily for me they kind of believed me and which were true obviously and they kind of didn't they sent me to another home back in Halifax mm -hmm. so I kind of just again straight joined back in with the young people in that area from homes that I'd lived at um, which I was glad to be back in Halifax but none of my behaviours had changed my behaviour had just got worse um, and often people had kind of remarked there's been a stark change in his behaviour and stuff and, and there was I kind of didn't care about myself at that point so I certainly didn't care about anybody else either um, so I was quite an angry young man um, very often and I'd kind of misbehave a lot and I smash stuff up and damage stuff in whatever home I were in and stuff like that um, because I tried to build relationships but I wasn't really building any I would have more moves than I had relationships so I kind of almost give up investing my time into people um, to make relationships because I knew I'm only going to get moved at some point anyway and that's kind of that was my kind of mentality at that point well, we're in a home with another young person there and kind of the older people I were hanging around with kind of they're like no grassing and no sex offenders and stuff like that. And I were in a home with another boy there and he was getting done for sexual offences. So I kind of I walked in to the room and he was kind of doing some art. So I picked kind of a pen up and I stuck it through his hand and kind of almost stuck it to the table. Um, so I got arrested for that. But I didn't get moved and neither did he, so they sent me back to that placement. Um, and then because he grasped me up, I beat him up again and got arrested again. And then ended up getting um, taken to out of authority, basically. They kind of moved me again then at this point to a place called Withington in Manchester. Um, but again, that were again with older people and me, they were kind of more 16, 17, 18 at this point. And my kind of mental health had deteriorated quite a lot at this point. Um, and I kind of used to cut myself with glass or razor blades just to see if it had hurt. And it didn't because I was so numb. I didn't kind of feel it at all. And then on another occasion, I took loads more paracetamols and got took to hospital and then given charcoal drinks, which is, I wouldn't recommend it. It's absolutely awful. Um, but I had to drink all this stuff and it, it wasn't very nice. Um, so then on another occasion, I kind of got loads of beads and stuck them around my neck and tied it to a door. So I went to staff pulled it, kind of pulled my head um, because I just didn't care, I didn't feel anything. I didn't care about myself, I didn't care about anybody else. Um, and then one of the staff kind of screamed when they kind of opened the door and kind of pulled my head. And then quite quickly the police came and cut it off. Um, and then I was taken to Manchester Bridewell and stripped naked and given a paper suit and stayed there for about two hours and then taken back to the home. So at this point, um, I got back to home and quite quickly after that, three big men turned up and told me I'm now getting taken to a secure unit in Salford um, called Barton Moss. So I was escorted there with these three men that I'd never seen before. Um, and apparently the court had uh, granted a 28 day um, kind of secure order for a full psychological assessment. So when I got to this security unit, kind of my behaviour was still kind of erratic and quite chaotic. So I'd get restrained sometimes and 
and the other young people kind of there as well they were quite high profile young people um like on my unit was one of the jamie bulger killers who had obviously committed horrific offense and there were another boy on there who were from scotland and he'd set the house on fire and some of his relatives had died and and i were there for welfare grounds so it kind of didn't sit right but within that I kind of enjoyed the stability of and the education um, because that kind of was the only stability I had had for quite a while. Mm-hmm. My life had been quite hectic and committing crimes and taking drugs and drinking. So it was kind of almost a relief to be in a place like that, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But I went back to court after 28 days and the, um, the judge extended for another 28 days and the psychological assessment hadn't been done. And then this went on for kind of three and a half months and the full psychological assessment still hadn't been done. So they let me out. So I'd actually learned now. And if you don't learn, if nothing changes, nothing changes and nothing changed for me other than I got a period of stability and enjoyed the education. Um, But I came out and again, quickly got back involved with other young people there that were taking drugs and drinking and, the offences were getting more serious and more regular. The drugs were getting harder and it were kind of more crack and heroin at that point because I used to hang around with older people. Um, and I'd kind of committed an assault and some other offences like criminal damages and stuff like that. And I en- ended up getting sentenced to six months in Medway Secure Training Centre in Kent, um, which at that point it were the very first secure training centre in, in the UK. And I was one of the very first young people to be sent there. Um, and the first from my area or West Yorkshire in general, because it were all like papers and that kind of stuff. And so I got six months there. And if anyone knows anything about Medway, it was very volatile, very unstable. And it was kind of a bit of a riot at most of the time, to be honest. And there were eight units with five young people on each unit. Um, and it was run by group four and then in the middle because it was kind of a circle in the middle of that the there were a bench and the group four first response would sit on that so when a staff member on each unit pressed a button for assistance all these group four men had run to whichever unit it was and stuff and they weren't very friendly to be honest um sometimes you get hit with a shield and then you get twisted up and stuff like that and you'd have knees in back of your neck and fingers on your nose and on all these pressure points and getting twisted up in all different kinds of positions which i'm trained in price and mapper within restraint and i've never learned any of them um kind of moves that i got put under um so i can't say there were restraints they were actually assaults and you always knew if you were going to get it bad because i were kind of upstairs so if you got brought back from education or gym or wherever if you'd been misbehaving they'd kind of twist you up and drag you back but you knew if if you got took under the stairs before you went upstairs you knew you were going to get it worse um, and that happened to me on a couple of occasions and they were kind of one particular guy group four and he, he enjoyed it he'd kind of wind you up and try get a response from you and then as soon as you reacted then he'd be straight in and kind of almost smiling at you kind of enjoying what he were doing but these were big men and we were kind of young people and you could see we were getting gratification from actually doing that to us and which wound us up even more um because obviously you've got someone smiling and enjoying hurting you so we kind of weren't really learning out and certainly didn't have respect for them. But again, quite weirdly, I almost enjoyed it there and the stability of it and the education side of it and that kind of stuff. Um, because again, my life was so hectic outside and I was constantly running away from home, wherever I was placed and taking drugs and committing offences and that kind of stuff. So it was nice to have a bit of a break. Um, but I'd applied for appeal um and i got my appeal nine days before my sentence finished and then i got took to bradford crown court by four group four from medway so there was one at either side of me in back of a car and two in front and it was about a six hour drive which is a long time to be sat in in the middle of two guys squashed um and then when we got to court and i got took up and took up in front of the judge um, I had the four that came with me from Medway plus the two group four from Bradford Crown Court. So I'm stood there five foot no, and I've got six group four around me, um, like which is 
I found a bit overpowering and stuff and I quite quickly got some kind of enjoyment out of it because the judge kind of said to him, murderers don't even get this treatment and kind of had a bit of a go at him. So I kind of took a bit of pleasure in that and he sent four of them out um, and two of them just stayed. And I think he felt a bit sorry for me at that point as well. But So he granted my appeal, so I got out, but I got a whole new sentence with that. So in my head, I was thinking I should have just finished this nine days of my sentence, um, which I'd got a new sentence and I only had nine days left. I got a two-year supervision order, attendance centre and an intensive treatment order when I could have just finished my last nine days at that point. But I was glad to obviously get out. But now it changed again. I'd come out and the offences were getting worse. The drugs were getting harder and more frequent. So I kind of just slipped back into that with my friends. Some were already in young offenders and that kind of stuff. Um, but the drugs we were taking were crack and heroin and we were committing robberies and knife point robberies and false imprisonments, which I'm not proud of. But that to me became almost normalised behaviour. That's what we did. That's just how it would day in, day out, day in, day out kind of thing. And in the morning, we'd kind of go to a shop and press the button for it till, until it opened and then we'd grab some money and then buy kind of a family day over. And then travel around West Yorkshire to all different towns and cities and committing offences, kind of knife point robberies and stuff, and then move on to the next town or city and until we got enough money and then we'd go back to Halifax and then that gets spent on drugs and drink. And at this point, we were kind of staying at another one of his friends at that point who had left care and he had a bed sit, so we'd kind of all just stay there. And that's kind of how, how, what happened for quite a while. Um but eventually we got caught, which, and rightly so, um, because it were on alt news and in papers and stuff because the amount of stuff we were doing. Um, and eventually I got caught and I got sentenced. There were, I think there were like four or five of us that got sentenced. But some of the people that I got sentenced with had already turned 18, so they got sentenced as adults, um, which they got like double the sentence of what I got. So at this point, I was um, sent to Medway Security, uh, sorry, Weatherby Young Offenders Institution, um, which, again, it was pretty frightening, to be fair, on where there, because I'd never been in a young offenders. Um, and I didn't know what to expect or all. Um, but when I got there and booked in and stripped naked and searched and all that kind of stuff, got to, to see wing on Colin Woodwing. And then the first person that I seen when I got there, I actually knew he was from my town. Um, and he were a bit older than me as well um, and he were a red band on that wing so he got extra privileges of going out and cleaning wing and that kind of stuff so I settled in quite quickly there and when I came out for the first survey for tea time out of the 60 young people on that wing I actually knew about 15 of them from previous placements and places I'd been locked up and that kind of stuff so again it it helped me settle in quite quickly and I could choose when I went out on association kind of who I wanted to kind of hang around with so I had actual choices there and knew quite a few other people on other wings as well so I think out of that all young offenders I think I knew about 60 70 people from from my own town and plus from all different places I'd lived at um, so again that made my time there a lot easier but I kind of used it to my benefit, kind of, I played for the young offenders football team and then I did gardening and education and then art classes on an evening and that kind of stuff. So I made the most of my time there. Um, but while I was there, my social worker came to see me and told me that that's the last time they're going to be seeing me. It'll be my youth offending team worker that sees me after that. Um, so I didn't really have any visits pretty much in all time while I was there. Um, so the young, uh, the youth offending team worker came and seen me and stuff and they were getting close to me getting released and I said to him, look, I, I'm not asking, the only place I don't want to go is back to my mum's because it had happened time and time again and it broke down quite quickly. Um, so that's the only place I asked not to be sent to or to go live. And then when it came to being released, I got picked up by my youth offending worker and asked where am I going to live after here, which at that point, whether they were my 51st move in care to 37 different placements. And I'd also amounted 33 convictions in that time. 
and spent quite a lot of time in secure environments, with whether it being structured units, secure units, secure training centre and young offenders. So I'd experienced quite a lot of stuff within that few years of actually kind of being in care and custody. But when I got out, um, they wouldn't tell me where I was going. They said, we'll tell you when you get back to office. So when I got back to the office, they said, right, you're going back to your mum's. And, and I was quite pissed off because it was the only place I asked not to go to. And that was the place I was going. And I knew myself quite quickly that it's not going to last. Um, so I kind of went to my mum's and quite quickly it broke down, which it always had done because we always clashed. Um, so quite quickly it broke down and then I got told, right, I'm getting moved to a bed and breakfast miles away from home. Honest part, I'm going to have you seeing my youth offending team work kind of once a week for my sort of my license. Um, and I kind of didn't have any money and I won't kind of want any benefits or all at that point. So I kind of abandoned in a bed and breakfast. But it wasn't like your traditional bed and breakfast. You didn't get like a full English breakfast in the morning. I actually had more in the young offenders than I did in that bed and breakfast because in that bed and breakfast there was curtains, a bed and a wardrobe, there wasn't even a TV and then there was just a hole in the wall and then in the morning you get my cereal and milk and that was kind of it. Um, so I had, and I remember pretty much the whole time I was there thinking shall I just go out and commit another offence and get sent back to the young offenders because the, the young offenders when I originally went there you didn't get a TV in your cell or no like that it was reading and gym and kind of cleaning your cell and that kind of stuff but if you got to an honest level on level three you got a TV and shortly before I was getting out I got to an honest level and I had a TV in my cell and stuff like that whereas I'm now out I still felt like I was locked up. I actually had less stuff outside of the young offenders than I did inside. Like I said, I had a wardrobe, some curtains and a bed and miles away from home. And over that sort of week or two of being in bed and breakfast, I was eating like cornflakes and water. And my mental health deteriorated rapidly while I was there. And I were isolated miles away from home and everything like that. Um, but kind of from there, because my mental health had deteriorated that much, they kind of put me on a mental health ward in Halifax, um, in North Arum. So I was, went into this mental health ward and it was quite an intimidating place. There was a lot of ill people there um, with a lot of complex like, behaviours and disabilities and that kind of stuff. So it was quite an intimidating environment because it was kind of an open sort of ward at that point. They weren't like separate. It, you were kind of in a bay with sort of six people and they were generally a lot older than me. So it was quite an intimidating place to be at. But like I'd always knew, as soon as I got the opportunity, I run off like I always have done. Um, so I'd run off from there and one of my friends met with me, well they'd come to visit me and that was kind of my access to get out of there so I'd kind of run off when he were going um, and I, I'd run off for a few weeks and then got caught um, and my youth offending team worker was still involved with me, no social work at all um, and kind of told me he's got me a place in a hostel in Halifax so I moved to this hostel but not only that it also got me onto a project called Project Challenge, um, which I'm glad he did because Project Challenge were kind of three or four days a week and you learn about improvised rescues, first aid, doing your Duke of Edinburgh awards and kind of basic computer skills and that kind of stuff. And, and not only that, it was kind of the first opportunity I'd got where people didn't kind of give up on me. And I used to go there sometimes four or five days a week and they wouldn't ask me to go. Um, they'd make me a drink and... And I made relationships there, which for me were great because in my previous care sort of history, I'd had, certainly had way more moves than I'd had relationships or trust for people. And that was kind of a place where I started building trust with people and kind of laying people into my life and almost investing my time into them as well as because I could see they were investing their time into me. Um, and kind of at this project, there were 18 people that started. And if you got to the end of the six month course, you got to go to Italy and walk across the altar via one in dollar lights. So I did that every day and also build these relationships while I were there and kind of it were actually refreshing because that were kind of the start of getting me away from crime, drugs, drinking and all the behaviours I were doing. 
getting locked up and that kind of stuff. Um, and in that time, I never got locked up. I did kind of take drugs. I kind of focused on that because that's pretty much all I could have. You were either a choice between doing that or going back out and taking drugs and getting up. Committing more offences and basically spending my life getting locked up and all that kind of heard. Growing up is I'm going to be dead by 21. I'm locked up for a long time. I'm not going to remember too much. I'm not going to. I'm going to have a bleak future. I'm going to have all this negative stuff. But this project gave me the positives. And out of 18 people that started it, there were three of us that made it to the end of it. So for me, again, it was great because I got my first passport. It was the first time I was going on holiday. Well, it wasn't really an holiday, 16 days walking, but it was an holiday. It, um, so, yeah, got to go to kind of the supermarkets and trusted with money to buy us own stuff to last us for this journey of 16 days and then went to Italy and walked across the Alta Via, one in Dolomites for 16 days. Um, which were amazing. It was the best thing I'd ever seen at that point, and still some of the best things I've ever seen now. Um, and walked across Dolomites for 16 days, and then at the end of it, we went to Venice for a day. So again, it was so far different from what I'd been experiencing for the last years of my life. It would kind of a, give me a whole new perspective on life and kind of a big light bulb moment that there's all this world out there and stuff that I could do other than drinking and kind of taking drugs and committing offences and being awful to people, I suppose, because before that, I didn't kind of care about other people because I didn't care about myself. Um, but that project learned me so much and I grew so much within that and learned to trust people and build relationships. And that's what I was missing from being in care, as well as the stability. I've not had much stability. Like I said, I've been moved 51 times to 37 different placements and had 33 convictions. So I'd spent a lot of time kind of locked up and moving, very transient lifestyle. Um, but yeah, so I completed that. And then kind of from there, I've met my son's um, mum. And then in November 2002, um, 28th of November at 11.23, my son was born, which I was obviously proud and happy about and stuff. And, and it was, yeah, it was obviously a great morning. But later on that afternoon, I went outside to have a cig. And I've seen some young people I'd grown up with in care and I were asking them why why are you all here sort of thing and, and they said my friend, my best friend who I'd got locked up with who were already 18 and got double the sentence had got out that morning um, and he went to some high rise flats and he injected heroin and overdosed so instead of ringing an ambulance they took the £40 out of his pocket while he got released with and took his coat off and dragged him to the top of the steps and left him to die. So within a matter of hours of my son being born, my best friend were dead. So it was very, a lot of different emotions and feelings and anger and obviously grief and that kind of stuff. But also on the other hand of that, I'm proud and happy my son's being born. So I kind of won't wish it on anybody. It kind of messed with my head quite a bit. Um, but kind of from there, I just kind of coasted through life, but stayed with my son's mum. We were together like six and a half years and I have a lot of gratitude for her because she gave me kind of one straight and narrow as well. And the responsibility because I didn't want my son to experience anything I'd ever done. Um, but I'd still not resolved any of the trauma or the loss or the grief that I'd had in the childhood experiences I'd had. I'd had no therapy, no kind of meaningful kind of interventions at all. Um, so I kind of just coasting through and I'd be on a mental health ward for a few weeks and then I'd get let out and then I got some stability and, and that kind of stuff. And then, so by tw um, 2010, I'd, I'd obviously split up with my son's mom and I had my own sort of place and I were having my son three, four nights a week which again I have a lot of gratitude for him as well because if it weren't for him I, don't, I probably wouldn't be alive I'd probably have fell back into the kind of life of crime and that kind of stuff but we're always mindful and conscious that I don't want him to experience anything that I had so that was kind of my motivation and kind of inspired me to keep going but I just didn't feel part of anything at that point sort of thing um, other than my son and I 
invested pretty much most of my time in wrestling, which I'm glad I did, um, because that had benefits for me as well. And obviously, I had a good relationship with my son. Um, but then, kind of in 2010, someone suggested writing a book, which at that point, longest thing I'd ever wrote, were kind of a two sided piece of paper from a young offenders. Um, and my grammar and my punctuation and spelling were horrendous. And, you know, I didn't even know how to writing paragraphs never mind put it in chapters and form this book um so but i ended up getting this tower this old computer and i persisted with it for about nine months day in day out trying to get some kind of book together um and within that time i got offered to go to um derbyshire to speak to some young people at a children's home there and as it turned out one of the residential staff were actually an assistant professor at a university um so she offered to put my book into or put it into a book i suppose um which i was massively grateful for um but i'd also been applying for jobs and i think i'd sent about 200 applications out for jobs and i got one response out of everything saying you don't meet our criteria but I'd, I'd sort of got this book together and it had been edited at this point so then I put it in 2012 I put it on Amazon um, self-published and then it got 25 five-star reviews and no else um, so I kind of went back of that I ended up getting a publishing deal with Waterside Press um, which wasn't worth it first thing that I'd ever wrote properly and also it wasn't just the book it kind of gave me it were almost like a business card into doing lectures and presentations and started working on some local projects and then some national projects and then in 2013 i got um, asked to go on a european project called alternatives to custody um, trying to get a best practice model for all 28 european countries through a national voice and british association of adoption and fostering uh, so I got to travel to some different countries at this point and work with leading experts from different countries and trying to get this best practice model together, um, which were a Daphne project, which you can find on Google. Um, and at this point, because that was successful, I got asked if I'd do the focus groups with young people. Um, so I said, yeah, as long as I can pick these young people, because I wanted a variety of young people from all different behaviours from ones that are doing amazing at school to ones that are committing offences and having a stable sort of time. Um, so I chose these young people and did focus groups and because that was successful, then I got asked by the European partners if I'll um, choose some young people to sit on um, a panel at the University of London and the European experts are going to ask them questions and vice versa. Um, and as it turned out, it was day after legislation were announced for fostering to stay put. Um, and as it turned out, these young people that I'd chosen um, all happened to live in residential care and they were all visibly upset and angry and saying, well, what about me? I'd love to stay in my placement till I'm 19, 20. And I kind of, at that point, I didn't realise that it excluded 9% of some of our most vulnerable children and young people, which it did. And I kind of didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I said I'll do what I could. So then I got on on the phone to Ed Nixon, who I'd met at previous presentations and built a relationship with him, and it kind of become kind of a mentor. We kind of had a rank on way on from London. And then he said, right, well, well, we'll start a campaign. And he kind of chose the name Every Child Leaving Care Matters. And that's where Every Child Leaving Care Matters were born from the voice of the young people that we're working with. Um, because of how upset and visibly angry they was and said I'll do what I could not know what I could do. And quite quickly from there, give evidence at select committees and we got a German debate called in Parliament and we got a board together. And, and I think a lot of people didn't understand, but every child leaving care matters is all voluntary. Um, me and Ed have paid everything to do with that campaign out of our own pockets. We've never accepted funding from anyone because we don't want it to come away from a single issue campaign from the voice of the child, basically. And we wanted to do what we could for that. Um, but I wasn't happy just sat on the sidelines. So in 2015, I applied to work in residential care. Um, so and I was successful. So then I got a job working as an intensive support worker on a specialist provision with um, children and young people, some of the most challenging and complex young people in the country. 
um, which I loved that job for a while, for like I was sort of there for nearly a year. And then within this time of having my book and working on these local, national and European projects, I'd come runner-up in the UK Redemption and Justice Awards, runner-up in National Diversity Awards. And then I got a, a letter fruit door because previously I'd been working with the Department for Education's Children's Social Care Division. Um, and I got put forward to go to Buckingham Palace, which that were my invite to Buckingham Palace as thanks for my services to children, young people and families. So, which again is from the childhood I'd had and being told the what amount to much, I'll be dead by 21 and all this kind of stuff. I'd actually turned my life full 360 and got all these accolades and a published author and now invited to Buckingham Palace and that kind of stuff. And, and which were all great, but you know, it also caused problems with my own son because he wasn't that happy because I was working with other young people and because the shifts were four to 14 days at a time. So I wasn't seeing him as much. So it kind of affected him as well and his relationship at that point. So I ended up kind of leaving there as well um, and continued with the kind of work I was doing. But an incident happened within this home and and it just didn't sit right with me because it could have been avoided and should have been avoided and it won't. Um, and kind of my mental health again deteriorated. I relapsed on drugs after 12 years or whatever it was at that point and ended up sort of in 2018 on a mental health ward for three and a half months, um, which were quite a tough time because I didn't want to be alive. I'd kind of tried to hang myself and tree snapped at two o'clock in the morning, which I didn't know, which obviously I'm glad now. But at the time I was upset because I couldn't even do that right, even though I had all this positive stuff going on. I just couldn't see like a way forward sort of thing. So I ended up on this ward and medicated and someone sent me a journal. And so I'd write in that every day. And that's like the second book where I've got what a mental year, basically it's just written from the journal that I wrote in the mental health ward. Um, and then since then I kind of got back into kind of recovery services and worked hard on myself and kind of progressed kind of since then. And, now in a good place mentally because I paid for my own um, psychotherapy and psychology and that kind of stuff privately because I never had any to kind of resolve or kind of work on my own issues and I was good at helping other people but I wasn't very good at helping myself and so I paid for my own kind of therapy at that point um, which I'm glad I did I didn't realize at the time but now with hindsight it's it were a good investment in myself um, so I kind of missed out on all this stuff and sort of now by the time I've got to know that our 15 friends of mine that we used to be kind of together there's only kind of five of us alive now um 10 of them are already passed away through drugs and suicide um so that's kind of why I'm very passionate about the work I do and kind of try to make a difference for children now and future generations I've seen too much death through lack of support and options and opportunities for for children and young people and for me it's kind of about relationships that is paramount for me relationships and building trust with people where relationships are formed and maintained in care and after care and also giving them the options to stay put if they want that and I mean the amount of people that I'd want to stay put is probably quite small anyway but even still it still should be afforded to some of the most vulnerable children and young people in in society which obviously it's not um so yeah we're kind of seven years on campaigning still doing what we're doing um but we're probably further now away from Fres care to 21 than we've probably ever been and I've thought about quitting quite a few times and just thinking it's not going to happen, but I can't do that. You know, I kind of said to them, you know, people at that point who are now adults now that I'll do what I could. And I meant that and I'm over seven years still doing what I'm doing with a team of people and his own board and stuff like that. So it's kind of, yeah, the, the young people I will never give up on and all the other adults now, but there's still young people in their positions and stuff. And so I've worked in care. Well, I've lived in care, worked in care, and obviously now campaign for better options of care. Um, right, I'll leave there because I'm not time's ticking. Thank you. Ben, thank you so much for um, 
sharing that, your story there. I know how hard that is to do. And the way in which you did it was just so inspirational. When you'll be able to read the chat later, you'll see people talking about how you've inspired them, but how they have taken messages that you've given and inspired young people that they're working with. So the impact that you have had has been amazing. I know that there are loads of questions in the Q&A and we're not going to have time to get through all of them, but I'm hoping you'll be okay if, if Dave can go through a couple, because I know we agreed earlier David would go through those. So if Dave could go through some and maybe pick out ones that are really important um, to, to give to you, if that's all right, but get yourself a drink and just, you know, because that was a lot of um, a lot of talking and a lot of amazing sharing. So um, thank you so much. And I think lots of people have ordered the book, even as you're talking, because we've all been saying about how much we have enjoyed, not enjoyed the book, but learned from the book, how, you know, what an excellent book it is. So um, Dave, have you had a chance to go through the questions for... Um, I haven't. I've got one here that's quite a good one. It's a thought one. And then I'll go through and try and find the good ones. Uh, ben, as I always say, man, thank you so much for your input. Um, it's been invaluable. Um, so one question from Tabara Base. Um, could you give me one thing to always do and one thing to never do in my work as a resi worker and next year when I qualify as a social worker? Well, two important things is... First of all, listening and building relationships and then also stickability, not giving up on young people. And then one thing, uh, giving up on people, don't give up on people. But I, I also understand, like, sort of for social workers, the attainment is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It used to be a lifelong career where I think attainment now is like four to six years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because social workers aren't supported properly from managers above them and that kind of stuff. So it's harder for social workers to support young people when they're not being supported properly and they have a massive caseload of 40 and that kind of stuff. I've got friends that are social workers and they've been in front of me crying and saying I can't meet the needs of all these children young people I'm working with and and they've ended up on medication and left left the profession and stuff and it's they're not supported properly so I think for a start social workers need to be sort of supported properly so they can support the young people properly and they'll be have a longer relationship with that child but Social workers change quite frequently, unfortunately, and that's for a multitude of reasons. Um, but for me, it's kind of sticking stickability, like maintaining relationships with children and young people for as long as possible. And I know it's generally IROs that have the longer term um, relationship with the young people in care. They're kind of they're around a lot longer generally than social workers, but. No, I think social workers need to be supported properly so they can support the young people properly, give them caseloads that they can manage and they can actually do the job that they came to do. I've never met someone that's coming to social work to be a bad social worker. Some people just start cut out for it and that's the same for any profession, any career. You know, some people just start cut out for that stuff. Um, and don't also understand like the reality of practice on a day-to-day -day basis and how stressful and tiring that can be and demanding um, especially when you can't meet the needs of the young people that you wanted to make that for and because they're so restricted and it's it starts way above social workers they need to be supported properly yeah yeah gold um you've kind of answered a few other questions um but there's um a few that had the same um Thread, was there any professional that stands out in your journey? Like, who was the significant person for you? And what were the qualities of that person, if that makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was kind of a sessional worker from the youth offending team um, called John. And, like, I showed him how to fish and kind of he'd take me out and we'd go for drives or go fishing and that kind of stuff. And because when I was younger... I kind of didn't like authority figures, so police locked me up and beat me up. Social workers moved me, offended, youth offended team locked me up. But he was a sessional worker, mm -hmm. so he were kind of different. So I kind of didn't judge him the same as I did everyone else at that point. And I started building a good relationship and rapport with him. But 
because I was getting moved so frequently and out of authority, I couldn't maintain that relationship. Um, but looking now, I mean, he's about 80 summit now and I'm still in contact with him. So he's kind of the only person that I'm still in contact with out of all that. I feel that there's always the one, isn't there? Um, I'm still in touch with my, with my guy too, and he's 56 now. So um, there's this one here. Um, and I, I'll read the whole thing because you are so brave to share your story. What could you advise for young people who are entrenched in a similar lifestyle um, to encourage them to embrace positive change? I think that's hard, but what do you think? Mm. Again, it comes down to relationships where trust is formed. If they don't have that, then how can you build on that? How can you kind of steer them away from the life of crime, drugs and drink and that kind of stuff? If I mean, you've got to look at it kind of one way. You know, a lot of children have moved multiple times. And like I was saying in my presentation, you, you get moved so many times, you stop investing your time in people because you think, well, I'm only going to meet a new social worker or a new this or a new that or I'm going to be moved placement. And you kind of... As you'll understand, you kind of stop investing your own time into people because you think, well, it's just going to be the same anyway. So I think it's hard once young people get to 14, 15, 16, they're almost kind of get stuck in that way of life. And I think it's very hard to steer them away from it unless, you know, they have these positive relationships and positive role models to kind of guide them and influence them to be that there's a better life out there than committing crime and taking drugs and being locked up and that kind of stuff. Um, but sometimes as care experienced young people, we have to go through that stuff to come out the other side. But unfortunately, like I said, out of my 15 friends, 10 have passed away through drugs or suicide. So it's it's it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Definitely. It's, uh, it's, relationships are key, aren't they? So, uh, 100%. Sorry, Siobhan. David, I was just wondering about... Um, I know that we're going to talk later, Ben, about what ask, what parts of tonight we can put onto YouTube. But one thing that just strikes me is young people being able to watch Ben's story on YouTube is actually going to be a really helpful thing. And that's something that, you know, professionals could direct people towards. I've seen people in the chat saying, I want to tell the young people I work with about your story. But actually hearing the story from Ben is probably going to be more powerful and we are going to have that available, Ben, aren't we? Hope, you know, we're going to talk about what aspects we leave in there. So um, that's just, just a thought, really, in answer to that question. No, good um, idea. I would say as well, like, um, I'm, I'm reworking my poetry book, but Ben and Jenny Fagan were the two biggest ins inspirations for me to write a book because I'm care experienced also. So it has a massive ripple effect, I will say. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm just aware of the time. I'll ask one more, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so two seconds to point again there's been another like 10 or 15 questions since I started reading through so let's find this one Dave there's one there's one here that the team have put into the chat saying they and there's a bit of a vote on it that they really liked the question that um, it says Ben you've not mentioned your social workers in detail particularly um, what was your experience of social workers? Did you feel that they listened or wanted to spend time with you, get to know you and understand you? Or did you feel differently about social workers specifically? I know you've talked about the sessional worker and I know you've been very supportive of the profession in what you said earlier as well, but your own experiences of a social worker. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to me investing my time into them. It came to a point when I'd met so many people. And I again, I had so many different social workers early on. So I kind of thought I didn't I didn't get to kind of build relationships with social workers. It were more kind of the youth justice side of stuff that I built relationships with. Um, and because sometimes they'd come and see me and I'd brick the car and uh, kind of abuse them, verbally abuse them and stuff like that. So I never wanted to build relationships with them, which I know it's quite, a, it's not a, a nice thing, but that's just the way I was because quite early on, I had a few different social workers. So again, it's that investing my time in people. I've done this five times. Why am I going to keep doing it when I, you know, in a short amount of time, and we have another one and another one and another one. And I think there's a limit to how many times you can ask young people to build relationships with that many different adults in their life from different services that they, they just eventually give up on it. And that's why I think it is so hard to change young people once they get to a certain age because there's only so much you'll take and there's only so much you'll invest your time into building relationships before you just think, you know what, I've done this five times, no, I'm not doing it. 
<laughs> yeah, and especially when it's people who are supposed to have read your notes and already know your story, and then they ask you to tell it again. So sorry, just that's my little dig to all my fellow social workers. So. <laughs> Um, there's this other question here that I thought was quite interesting because we spoke about age and staying put and stuff. So I was a foster carer before venturing into social work. I have a stay put arrangement. Um, the, the IRO said she was surprised because um, she was placed at nearly 17. What can we do to advocate the importance of staying put? It really is so important. Just to add, my young person started uni and I am so proud. And we're proud too, Gillian. We're proud too. So... Um, so yeah, basically, what what do you think we could do to advocate for staying put? Um, because obviously, like you said earlier, not every young person is going to want to stay. Yeah. Well, Scotland's miles ahead of us in England um, in that regard. But I think it, it it's kind of it's a massive, massive false economy not to support these children and young people. You know, it's it's can't stress how important relationships are and maintaining that and having some stability in the home with stability, security, relationships, people they trust. I mean, it's going to cost so much more further down the line in kind of benefits, housing, prisons, mental health wards and that kind of stuff. It's a massive false economy not to invest in young people, but unfortunately we have government that's so short-termism in thinking and they don't want to invest in young people, which I, I have one question, would it be good enough for their children? And the answer is no. And if it's not good enough for their children, why should it be good enough for our children in care? You know, they need investing in it. It's like my son now, which is the biggest achievement I've got, He's 18, he were 18 in November, he's never been in care, he's never been arrested, he's doing a plumbing apprenticeship, he bought his own car for his 18th birthday, you know, and for me that is my biggest achievement, forget Buckingham Palace and a published author and all that kind of stuff, the pressure of being care experienced and my mum being in care and me being in care and breaking the cycle of my son not going in care is the most, the biggest achievement that I could ever achieve, no matter whatever I achieve after this, will never compare to that. Um, and it's like at 18, I'm not going to say to him, right, I don't want to see you again. Off you go. You just won't do that. And like we were saying earlier, you know, the care experience is lifelong and relationships should be maintained. And if a young person settled in a home, wherever that be, they should be allowed to stay there for as long as they need, in my opinion. And that obviously includes staying put, but there's not enough funding and it's also putting a lot of foster parents in awful situations because they can't financially manage to support these young people whereas if they, they could then they would and and I think it's just it's just so underfunded and it's it's a it is a good piece of legislation but it's not doing what it could do no, and should fully, do. Fully agree with you man fully agree and I think yeah Scotland is ahead but there's loop, there's loopholes here too um, I'm just going to say, because of the time, um, thank you so much for your presentation and for answering all the questions. i um, just going to hand back to Siobhan, if that's okay. Um, and thank you again so much, man, from me and from everyone in the chat, because they've all loved you. Yeah, so. you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So many people in the chat saying, uh, well, you know, I'm going to send you the chat so you'll be able to read it. But people just saying thank you, how inspirational you've been. Congratulations for everything you've done and breaking the cycle and all of those things. Um, just, I have said this earlier in the chat, but I do just want to reinforce that I know that there's people in the audience and um, what you've shared has maybe brought up some issues for them. And hopefully you all have support at home, um, that there's somebody there that you can talk to if tonight has raised any issues for you. But if you don't have that support and you want to reach out to us, we'll keep an eye on our email tonight. Um, Dave will just put the email address into the chat to remind you all and we'll keep an eye on that email tonight and if anybody needs any support from us we will offer that as a team to you we are going to uh, we have a plan I think it's about a month or six weeks time for us to do a webinar which looks at social workers who have lived experience and what we share from that and we are that that is on I think it's about six weeks time the team will tell me when it is it's on the timetable anyway um, because we know this is an issue for many people who go into the profession so thank you so much Ben that support is there for anybody who is going to want it I'm just going to go back to screen sharing now so that people can see and um, we've 
put into the chat all night tonight the link so that you can buy um, Ben's book. Um, it's been in there. Well, I think we've put the links for both books in there tonight. I think Dave's been uh, doing that, as have other team members. Um, so really, we just want to say thank you so much to Ben for coming tonight, for agreeing to do the session and for just being uh, just the way you've presented has been so um, captivating, Ben. Thank you so much. And everything that you're doing for children and young people now is so important. And thank you for sharing that with us. I know lots of people like to come each week and wait for the end of a session for the sessions link for the following week. So you can see in front of you now on the screen the sessions we've got coming up the next few weeks. So next Wednesday we'll be with Jennifer Simpson, who is going to be looking at strategies for owning your placement and overturning the language of deficit, a really important one for students, particularly around looking at diversity issues. We're then going to be looking at moral injury, which is something we've talked about a few times in these webinars, but we're going to be delving into that in a bit more detail and then share back to basics. And then we're looking at good report writing and um, assessment skills. So thank you uh, ever so much. I think the links will be going in for next week's session if you want to register for that now so that you can pick up the link out of there. Again, I would just say thank you so much to Ben. Thanks to all the Social Work Student Connect team as usual for everything that you do. And um, thank you very much, uh, particularly to Dave, who has done a, a lead on tonight's session as well. So thank you so much to everybody. And um, and good night, everyone. Thank you.